Well, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the, um, the opportunity to get together today. Uh, by way of reminder, I am Mike Gerhardt, scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center. And we are meeting in a very special location. I guess we don't normally get to see the lovely uh, history outside our window, um, as well as enjoy it inside. I want to just uh, go over a few logistics, if it's OK, at the beginning before we start our program. Um, as usual, please make sure to turn off all cell phones or anything else that could make noise. Um, uh, and otherwise, I want to tell you, of course, about an incredible fall that we've got planned here at the National Constitution Center. Um, a remarkable set of events. In fact, so remarkable, I'm not going to be able to go through the whole list. Um, but you should obviously want to check um, your schedules and check online, among other things including religious liberty advocate Christina Arriaga, uh, Civil War historian Ed Ayers, former, former Florida governor and presidential candidate Jeb Bush, journalist and former New, New Republic editor Franklin Four, longtime host of CBS's Face the Nation Bob Schieffer, esteemed historian David Blight, and the list goes on and on, which is exactly what it should do. Um, uh, copies of the schedule are available at registration and online at constitutioncenter.org slash debate. And of course, without further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Jason Opel, Associate Professor of History at McGill University in Montreal. He is the author of Beyond the Farm, National Ambitions in Rural New England, and the editor of Common Sense and Other Writings by Thomas Paine. And he's here today to discuss his most recent book, Avenging the People, Andrew Jackson, The Rule of Law and the American Nation, which he will be signing copies of after the program. So I want to welcome Jason to the National Constitution Center. So Jason, um, there are all sorts of places to begin, but I'm going to choose this one. <laughs> um, as you probably know, um, it, sitting in the Oval Office in President Trump's Oval Office is a portrait of Andrew Jackson. It so happens that when he was President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln had a portrait of Andrew Jackson uh, in his office, though it was a different portrait. So what is it these presidents see or have seen in Jackson that causes them to perhaps revere him in that way? Uh, well, I think that there are just sort of two ways to go with that. One is on the presidential side, just from a president standpoint. Jackson certainly strengthened the presidency. He made certain um, both sort of symbolic and structural gestures that I think really strengthened the presidency, um, both by more vetoes and more vehement vetoes and more memorable vetoes. Um, his assertion that he, the, the president, was the sort of pure voice of the people as opposed to the legislative branch and certainly the, um, certainly the courts. So if you're a strong president or you, you know, sort of want to project strength in various ways, and most presidents do, Jackson would be certainly a guy to, to go for. The more complicated side, I think, has to do with the nature of the, the narrative of Jackson and, and democracy. And the idea that Jackson um, represented in some pure form or some more un, unedited form uh, the people's will. Uh, I think it's a, it's a legitimate and important uh, argument uh, that these presidents, especially the current president, um, also Harry Truman was also very uh, vocal about his admiration for Jackson. Of course, Polk was a Jacksonian. Um, they, they believe and want to project. Franklin Pierce, too. Yes. <laughs> a whole line. Um, and so we're, I don't know if we're here to revise that image or not, uh, or we'll challenge it to some extent. But let me complete that image a little more, if I may. Um, as we were talking, as we, we walked in, you were reminding me um, of something that's uh, a monument back home. I, in my day job, I'm a constitutional law professor at the University of North Carolina. And in Raleigh, there is a great monument of Andrew Jackson really commemorating his founding democracy or what he's done for founding democracy. Yes, there's a
Well, maybe one of the things, of course, people uh, revered is something we will reveal more of now, and that is the anger that Jackson exhibited really throughout much of his life. So where does it start? It starts at an early age? Yes. I think uh, it's certainly fair to say that um, the violence in the southern backcountry, especially in 1780 and 81, uh, when the British really concentrate and the Civil War really explodes, is uh, horrific, extremely intense violence, violence without, without fronts. And Jackson suffered tremendously. He basically lost his whole family. Um, and he does seem to have had very early on, it's very hard to get to because it's a pretty obscure uh, background. Um, he really seemed to have a sense of himself, really seems to be given to him by his mother, uh, that he was a special person, that he had particular gifts, which he certainly did, and that this was all taken from him by the British, by loyalists, by many native uh, peoples. And so there's this kind of fury in him from this. He exhibits, he claims to exhibit early on that he has a kind of violent uh, pride that when people offend him, he'll, they, they can't offend him. You, you, know, you have to show me respect or one of us has to die. Um, I think it's fair to say that in 1792 to 94, to me, one of the most important undeclared wars in American history, I'm not even sure you'd say it's an American war, um, is ex horrific events in the extreme frontiers of, of Tennessee. Um, Jackson felt betrayed, uh, understandably betrayed by the federal government. And he brings this rage to public life um, that did not always make him popular. And then he, earlier in his career until I would say before 1812, it often did not make him popular. But at some point, his fury, his, um, his indignation, it's an important word, you know, it has dignity in it, uh, resonated with American people, uh, with most American people, not all American people. And that's what I wanted to find out in the book, why, why that was the case. So I want to track some of those different sort of theories, so to speak. Uh, let's go back to the one with regard to the federal government. Sure. Um, I mean, Jackson, as you point out in your book, and maybe we sometimes <laughs> forget, was, was there at the time of the Revolutionary War uh, and was there in the first Congress. Yes. Um, and so he's a rather interesting yeah. figure, uh, much more extensive background than we sometimes acknowledge. But what, where's, what's the betrayal with the federal government that irks him early on? And yeah, so I guess two things. The first is that I think it's a major, uh, often you know, kind of mythology that Jackson comes from an anti-federalist tradition. I don't think so. He actually is from a federalist tradition in many in many ways um, in terms of his ideas about the judicial uh, authority and such. But he's a servant of the territorial government in Central Tennessee, which is a it's a colony. It's like an island. It's not connected to the rest of Tennessee, so it's surrounded. And between 92 and 94, 1792 and 1794, uh, mostly uh, Ch uh, Cherokee and Creek um, uh, militants attacked the settlements. Um, they were extraordinarily vulnerable. There are reasons why they were attacked, but for those two years, it's a, basically a waking nightmare. And Jackson, at this time, was a judge advocate, which means he was in charge of getting the militias out. And he routinely was doing his civic duty, as he saw it, far from home, where his, meaning his wife was home. Uh, there's some evidence of uh, attacks within a couple miles of their home. Um, and the federal government re repeatedly, at this time in Philadelphia, said, do not uh, use offensive uh, force. You have to remain inside territorial lines. You can only cross Tennessee River in hot pursuit, which is a legal concept of hot pursuit you can go. And he felt betrayed. And in his first speech, he, he repeatedly says, and the, the verbs are important, he says, you know, the, the hatchet is raised. So it's like there's an emergency time now, which means we have the right to have the, the law of force in our own hands. And he felt understandably betrayed by the federal government for its, as he saw it, refusal to first protect and then avenge uh, the people of, of the Monroe District of Middle Tennessee. And as you say, his very first speech in Congress is that, and he's seeking what, uh, reparations? That's basically. correct. Yes, basically. So, you know, like often the case in the early republic, people have to pay for things before they, they, they have to pay on, on credit, and the territorial government basically pays for some of its war effort in 1792-94 by giving, giving IOUs. And one of his major tasks as congressman is to get that paid back, uh, which largely succeeds. But beyond that, there's the sense of you betrayed, you didn't avenge our blood. Um, Jackson's a very strange kind of religious, he's not conventionally pious, but I think he's actually quite religious in many ways. And his 
belief in the blood that had to be redeemed was very intense. And he never forgave the Washington administration. Um, that's why he sounds like an anti-federalist. But he's anti-federalist because he hates the federal government for having, <laughs> for having uh, abandoned the, the middle Tennessee, not for its earlier efforts to create a more perfect union. Well, I, and I want to move to some of the other uh, attributes that uh, you talk about with respect to Jackson, but I want to sort of track one another path of that sort of anger as well, at sure. least make it more explicit. And that is, of course, he's fighting Native Americans. Yes. And so he's got, his experience are, experiences are largely in battle in his early, early days up until the time he joins Congress. Uh, yes. Uh, as judge advocate, he's in charge of sort of going around the, uh, the countryside of these settlements to get militiamen in the field. Um, so a lot of it's sort of mobilizing uh, horsemen and, and infantry, especially horsemen, are much more useful. Um, but also actual combat. Um, there's an incident in 1793 when he apparently is, uh, he definitely was ambushed with three other people and barely survived. Again, these would be by Chickamauga warriors, or Cherokee warriors. Um, so he's, you know, has a visceral sense of violent conflict with Native peoples. And um, if one is sort of looking ahead or looking for the sort of deep roots of what I think is the signature policy of his presidency, which is the removal of the Southeastern tribes, um, you know, there, it's, such, it's so obvious to him as that this is the just desserts for the suffering that he had uh, personally experienced. It just seems obvious to him. And as early as 1794, 95, you have officials in Middle Tennessee saying every Cherokee and Creek has to go, um, you know, quite explicitly. And to that, in that respect, as well as in others, Jackson is nothing if not consistent. So now we've, we've touched on a couple other attributes. I, again, I just want to sort of spell out. He obviously has a very strong sense of honor. Yes. And, and at the same time, he's a lawyer. That's right. So this man who's got so much rage and this man who's a very adept at battle, um, how does the, his commitment to honor and ultimately his being a lawyer uh, round out his personality in these early, up until the time he joins Congress? I think it, it, up to that time and throughout his life, the kind of the sequence goes, I am lawful, therefore I am innocent, therefore I am aggrieved, right? So it's like, you know, the, the people are, can be avenged because they already are lawful. And now his idea of lawful in an economic sense and in a um, political sense to some extent is much more conservative and federalist than I think most historians have, have said. And so this is, I guess, the innovation or the intervention I wanted to make was to really make that point. Um, but how does it interact with honor? Um, and he chafes like many, most of the uh, you know, major revolutionary elites do uh, about restraints on their, uh, on their personal honor, any kind of insults. This is why duels are so common uh, among the gentry. Um, but it's more the idea, I think it's more uh, uh, re relevant, is the idea of when the people are empowered to avenge themselves. That is to take violence without consulting the law. And he really developed this idea that the people that deserve to be called the people uh, are, are always you know, in, a, in a kind of emergency time. They're always uh, attacked or at risk of being attacked. And hence, they have to go above the law. They have to take the law into their own hands, which comes from a conception that you have God-given rights to use your hands, your fists. Um, in civil legal theory, you give that up once you enter society. And the state takes care of punishment. Um, Jackson was never comfortable with that, um, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> and that's very important for this idea of being lawful and also able to go above the law. And of course, a lot of this is happening in Tennessee, yes. North Carolina and Tennessee. Um, and there's uh, some remarkably colorful characters you talk about yes, there are. Um, in this book. Let's talk about one of those characters who has a statue not too far from here because he was involved with the creation of the Constitution. And this is William Blunt, who turns out to be a very influential figure in Jackson's life. So as he's, I'll use the word maturing, <laughs> uh, he's also got a, a sponsor and a mentor, yes. and it's Blunt. So tell us about Blunt. He was a North Carolina uh, paymaster during the war. I suspect that gave him a sense of this might not, this might not work out because North Carolina's finances were so uh, tenuous during the war. He and his brothers had a very far-flung business empire. They had markets, or they had uh, business contacts in the Caribbean, uh, what is now Germany, 
he was looking for investors in London. He's a, he's a businessman and a massive uh, a land speculator on a massive scale. Um, we don't actually even know how many acres he claimed because he, di he didn't even know how many he was claiming, probably about a million acres. Um, he's a federalist insofar as he wants the government to ensure certain kinds of speculative properties. And he's Jackson's, um, I'm not sure I'd say mentor, he's his patron uh, for the better part of the 1790s. Jackson correctly uh, understands that if you want to make something of yourself and become powerful in post-revolutionary United States, the fastest way to do that is to become a lawyer. And if you have a patron like Blunt, who can sponsor you, who can make you judge advocate, who can recommend you, as he did for Congress later, you get places. Um, so I, I would say that in some strange ways, Andrew Jackson actually sort of reminds me of a kind of frontier version of Alexander Hamilton. And the difference, one of the many differences, though, is that Hamilton has this practice and becomes a, you know, a, a, a respectable person after the war in, in New York. Um, and his patron is, of course, George Washington. It's just that Jackson's in the middle of Tennessee, and his patron is slightly less, let's say, exemplary. Blunt, Blunt is a more, he has a very flexible idea. Um, I quoted in the book, he actually says and routinely to his surveyors, just make up names, ghost names, to get more, to claim more, more um, acreage. He's quite, you know, he's quite, he doesn't match the idea of a kind of Cincinnati type person. That's not Blunt. Um, and th it doesn't mean that Jackson was like that, but j he was Jackson's, Jackson's uh, guy. Well, uh, maybe even before we move on to some of the other figures that are, you know, play prominent parts in Jackson's sort of rise to power, uh, let's maybe tell the rest of the, the Blunt story. Because Blunt um, isn't, I mean, he, he rises to being governor, yep. he rises to being senator, but of course, along the way, uh, he's going to incur some problems, right. uh, which are not. You're, we're not making this stuff up. <laughs> so it's, what happens to Blunt? It's quite remarkable. He actually seems to, so he's so over leveraged with how many, uh, the, the amount of lands that he's claimed. Um, <laughs> and has, he owes so many people for having purchased the preemption rights or other forms of le legal control to those lands that he finds himself terribly in debt. He finds himself also cut off from some of those investments by the federal government's treaties with Native peoples. So it appears that he, sort of like an Aaron Burr thing, it's sort of not clear what he's doing, but he seems to have decided to, to collude with Spanish and British officials about making a new state south of the Tennessee River. This falls into the hands of um, President Adams uh, and U.S. Senate, who promptly you know, sort of show, ask him, well, what, what are you doing? Um, whereupon he sort of lights out in the middle of the night kind of thing back to Tennessee, uh, where he's still popular. Um, but he's you know, d disgraced as uh, the senator who appears to have been trying to commit some form of treason, even though it's hard to tell exactly what that is. Um, he dies shortly thereafter uh, of a flu. And Jackson, for a while, really, I think that's it's extremely bad news for Jackson because he was doing great uh, as a kind of federal appointee in a t under the territorial rule and under a guy like Blunt. Once Tennessee's a state, and they have their own power sources, and East Tennessee's in charge, he loses a lot. Well, and of course, Blunt is the first person to be expelled from the United States Senate. He's the subject of the first impeachment. Um, he's impeached by the House, and the Senate decides they don't really need to remove him from office since they've just expelled him. That's right. Um, but they thought about it. Um, uh, so, so Blunt has a very special place yes. in constitutional history. Yes. Um, uh, but he's not the only interesting person that um, Jackson comes across. Uh, he has a long, rather sometimes friendly, but often acrimonious relationship with the governor. Yes. There's another governor. Yes. So this is Severe. Sure. And so Severe is another person we need to sort of talk about because Jackson, will, uh, Jackson, in a sense, kind of develops his character, develops his understanding of government, <laughs> and also develops in other ways in his relationship with Severe. Yes. Uh, so Severe, uh, who looks dramatically like George Washington, and there's a, I think he, the artists like to uh, show that. Um, he is a, the most popular man by far in eastern Tennessee. Uh, they call him Nolichucky Jack. Uh, Nolichucky River is where he had his plantation and his slaves. Um, he was the kind of, if you're looking for the sort of swashbuckling kind of uh, military chieftain turned populist uh, politician, that's, that's, that's John Sevier. Um, I always say Sevier because in, in Quebec, but it's Sevier is how you pronounce that, I guess. Uh, yeah, he um, and Jackson immediately, they got along a bit in the, in the late 1790s, but then they very quickly crossed paths. 
Um, I mean, the state's not big enough for both of them. Jackson wants a piece of uh, authority in the new state of Tennessee. Sevier is much more interested in East Tennessee. Um, Jackson is the rising star among the militiamen and the militia captains in Tennessee. Sevier thinks that's just his right to have those, to have the control of the militia. So in 1803, they very nearly kill each other on at least two occasions. There's two major confrontations. Um, it's interesting to see their, their back This is with guns, too. Right? Yes, right, right. this is very close to, and this is, it's fascinating because both of them had this back and forth. We know from uh, a number of really good new work about duels, most affairs of honor don't actually result in a, you know, them shooting each other. They, they exchange letters saying, you know, give me satisfaction. Did you actually mean when you called me a liar? And the person replies, well, I didn't mean you were a liar. I just meant that what you said was totally untrue. <laughs> but, you know, so, and usually they find a way not to shoot at each other, um, but not, not Severe and, and Jackson. Probably, it's very hard to get the actual, but probably Severe made reference to um, Jackson's marital um, record and the unclear um, status of Rachel, his wife, uh, when they started living together as husband and wife, and he wanted to kill him. Jackson wanted to kill him. I mean, I'm, that I'm very certain of. He, you know, he, there's the, the kind of compulsive rage, and counting to ten does not work with Jackson. He, he cannot let go. <laughs> you know, he gets more and more mad when he thinks about what was said. Um, so they almost kill each other in 1803. Again, it's very bad for Jackson's career. He's almost shot the governor, this extremely popular person in your state. So for a while, I really see the, 1800, the early 1800s. Jackson is almost coming apart. I mean, he, you know, he's doing all kinds of stuff. He's a businessman. He's trying to do a huge export, import business. But his political fortunes are not good. And I don't really think they align very well with any particular political movement or party in the United States until the War of 1812. Yes, and now before we get there, let's, he's got one other uh, interaction, of course, uh, which is going to become almost legendary yes. in sort of the Jackson sort of lore, and that is that he does find himself in a duel. Yes. Um, and this is with another, this is a man named Donaldson. Now, I should tell you, I... I um, Dickinson. I, I'm, sorry, yeah, Dick, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Dickinson. Uh, so, uh, so with Dickinson, um, how does that arise? So the origin is there was a horse race that no one knew how to pay for. Jacks, there was a dispute about who was paying the forfeit money. Jackson was big into horse racing, as many Southern gentry were. And one thing led to another. He got into several actual physical confrontations with this new group of kind of hotshot lawyers uh, coming into uh, Na uh, Nashville. And one of them was this guy Dickinson uh, from Maryland. Something about him really just got Jackson uh, I don't know what it is. It's not actually an evidentiary trail. I really tried. I couldn't find it. Again, probably Dickinson said something about uh, Rachel. Uh, the idea, apparently he had a drinking problem and said something when he was drunk. And um, Jackson wanted to kill him. And repeatedly, people, very powerful people, kept telling Jackson, you know, be careful. This guy's a crack shot. You, you know. And he went ahead with the duel. Um, it appears that he tried to sort of prepare himself in certain ways to take a shot and survive. Um, I consulted my father, who's a doctor, about sort of why would a shot like this do this to Dickinson. But the long and short of it is he, he, he shot and killed Dickinson um, in Kentucky, across the state lines, to avoid the state law against dueling from 1801. Um, and this does not make him popular. I mean, this is another one of these things with the Jackson myth makes it seem like, oh, well, he's one of the guys, and people loved it. No, they didn't. I mean, you know, the people in Nashville were like, you know, this is, we're no longer the frontier. This is a respectable place. You know, you're, you're, you're out of line and, and kind of more crazy than honorable. And there's a very, there's a growing anti-dueling movement, um, largely based on the idea that killing someone is, among other things, not only illegal but unchristian. Um, again, I don't think Jackson's quite very popular at all. Uh, and shooting this guy does not help. Oh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, so to, uh, what happens in that duel is, of course, Jackson is shot first. Yes, uh, he tried to shoot and he right. clicks, but it's, yeah. And, but the uh, person first hit with the bullet is Jackson. That's right, yes. Um, and then Jackson then, in a sense, returns the favor and kills. Yes, the, 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 the controversy is so if you fired, but they clicked, it didn't discharge, but, they, but he clicked the, the, uh, the pistol. So some people would say, well, then you shot and you, that's it. But Jackson wanted to kill the guy and apparently waited for his eyes to clear uh, after having been hit himself in uh, the chest. 
uh, on the side. Uh, he was standing to the side, so kind of grazed him. Uh, shot him through the liver, most likely. And the guy probably died of septic shock, which is a particularly horrible way to die later that day. And again, you know, it's, there's no point in sort of understating the, or doubting the, the um, authenticity of Jackson's hatreds. I mean, you know, people said, well, geez, the guy was a young lawyer. He's got a young wife. They have a young kid. That just made him mad. He, it didn't make him sad. Um, and to my knowledge, he never apologized to anyone for, for anything. And Jackson car carried that bullet inside him the rest of his life? That's correct. Yeah. It, it, it hurt. It tore the pleural lining from his uh, ribs. So he probably had a weeping wound here. And then he had another altercation in 1813 with another big character named Benton, which blew Thomas his Hart -Benton. shoulder. And he really bled to death from that. So he has weeping wounds. And this is even before he's in the field in military campaigns, drinking contaminated water and probably getting uh, like, you know, constant uh, diarrhea for the rest of his life. So the man was, um, I make no bones about it, the man was certainly, if you're interested in someone who's a kind of reckless, physically courage, almost, courage, almost so. suicidal yeah. courage, there's really times where I think he might have said kind of a death wish. Uh, there's no doubting that. Jackson is 100% up to the legend of Jackson. Which is a great time now to think about his career in law and government. <laughs> um, so he's, tell us about his legal career. Uh, so while all this, other stuff is going on. He's supposed to be a lawyer and a judge. Yes, a lawyer, person, and a judge. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he he uh, in in the Cumberland country, so middle around Nashville, he he represents a number of clients, creditors and debtors, but especially creditors. Um, he displaces the lay attorney who I'm who there, there might have been two. Definitely was one who was working in Nashville, who was more popular with people because he wouldn't insist upon legal precision in drafting documents. So he's like the he's like you know in many ways a very sort of he brings elite knowledge. He's this is the part of the Jackson mythology that's wrong, that he's just some sort of backcountry. He's a lawyer who knows how to draft documents, who knows how to terminate partnerships, who knows how to attach properties, who knows what documents are binding, which ones aren't. Um, so he's this, then he's a judge. Um, he and his friend John Overton, who's crucial to my mind through his career, are I mean by any stretch conservative judges. By which I mean. They think the judiciary is there, like a Federalist would, to stop the states or stop the legislatures from interfering in forms of property, most especially speculative property. This is not to say that you know he's just this mean, rich guy. There's reasons that you would want to establish these kinds of protections for property, but it's definitely not the populist position. And that's what he is as a lawyer and a judge. Um, it's really interesting because him as a businessman as well, if I could just mention sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, so again, a lot of the Jackson mythology around his ideas of the economy traced this idea that he got uh, involved in a speculative dispute. Um, he almost lost everything, and then he was sort of the rest of his life against speculation or even sort of capitalism more generally. And uh, sort of, but I mean, you know, he, he, he goes wrong on one speculative venture to sell land. Uh, in, in Philadelphia, that goes terribly wrong. Um, Blunt, again, proves to be a not very good patron there. But he just keeps launching these very, very bold enterprises. Um, he tries to basically grow cotton on his plantations, have a cotton gin to produce it, to spin it, send it down Mississippi, sell it to Europe, buy goods from Europe, and bring them to Philadelphia, overland to uh, Pittsburgh, and then back to Tennessee. And it's a huge, you know, overdone kind of enterprise, which makes him very leveraged and makes him very vulnerable. Um, but again, the man is consistent. He always says, you know, if I have a debt, I, I have to repay the debt. And if the debt goes unpaid, you should repo my property. Uh, and he thinks the same thing for everyone else. And that's not the populist position, right? So I mean, they, they, there are repeated efforts in the South and West to do things called stay and replevin laws to shield debtors during certain times from the consequences of their debt. Jackson's always opposed to them, militantly opposed to them. And I think that's very important um, because it doesn't get into national politics because it's not supposed to be in national politics. The Constitution quite explicitly says you can't do that. And so I think that's an important part of Jackson. That's the less known part of Jackson. And of course, another thing that's happening with Jackson is that as um, that, that coincides or parallels some of what we're talking about, he's actually coming and going a little bit from Washington or Philadelphia as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, so he, he starts a term in the House, but then he doesn't finish it. That's right. So uh, tell us about that term and why it ends without completion. Yes, yeah, so he's, in, he's kind of more or less selected by Blunt as one of the first congressmen from the new state of Tennessee. Um, he's there to get people paid back for the recent war. Um, he really, you know, he is judging by his voting record, he's mad at the Washington administration for what, and Adams, for what has happened in Tennessee. He tends to be very militant about um, you know, insults to the United States, um, things like Jay's Treaty and such. Um, but he needs to go home, basically, to take care in part of this speculative venture that's gone bad with Blunt. Um, it's even possible that he agreed to a judgeship to sort of shield himself from some of those, um, some of that, of that mess. And he doesn't return to the US Congress until 1823. Um, so he has this sort of interesting career pattern where he suddenly really is a young man already in national politics. Then he's in the wilderness in state politics, not necessarily very popular, until 1823. And then he comes back as a senator before he. Uh, so, how is he able to come back as a senator then? Uh, in 1823, because of, of the War of 1812. Um, and I, I, I try to make a point in this book, and this is not just me, there's many new. Uh, books that argue this, that the War of 1812 is, should be thought of as, you know, as in many ways, as important uh, in the early republic as the revolution itself, that it's so, an event that so changes uh, the nature of politics, the nature of, the, of nationhood. Um, and Jackson is, it's, it's, you know, that 1814 when he wipes out the rebel Creeks, and 1815 when, of course, uh, he turns back the, the British uh, just, just below New Orleans makes him, you know, it, it's, I try to get a sense of, it's, it's, hard to get a, um, it's hard to convey the kind of emotional intensity that most Americans felt for Jackson without understanding how close the United States was or felt to collapse during the War of 1812, um, how vulnerable so many Americans felt during the war. Jackson saved them from their nightmares, like, just like that. And the, the power of that legend is virtually impossible to beat. John Quincy Adams says that this is, you know, anyone who touches this guy, you're going to go up against, he calls it the shock of his popularity. Um, so he goes back to the Senate. You know, the, the, the basic story is that he's a hero beyond, beyond any, any, other, any other person in the United States. And so what happens in the Senate? In 1823, yeah. so when he's there, he might have gone there because he was concerned about who was going to be the next mm -hmm. president. Um, it, it's not exactly clear why. But in 1821-22, he and Overton, his, his really close friend, decide they just need to go national with politics because in the state, um, things are not going well there. And he thinks that William Crawford, who's someone that we've all forgotten, he's actually a very important figure in this period, was going to be president. Jackson hated him intensely uh, for a variety <laughs> of reasons. So he goes, he wants to go back in national politics. And they had, probably he wants to be in the US Senate as a way to re-enter national politics and then become the president. When he's a senator, it's interesting. He doesn't really say anything. He doesn't do any dramatic speeches. He votes in quite um, moderate ways. He votes, uh, for example, against uh, for the abolition of uh, imprisonment for debt in federal cases, although that's narrowly defeated. He's pretty much, you know, he votes for tariffs, which is very important. Um, the only way he's an extremist in the Senate, 1823-24, is he votes always for the most militant measures possible against uh, native peoples in the Rocky Mountains uh, for the fur trade and Caribbean pirates. Um, he's way on the extreme uh, in terms of sort of how the United States can deploy force outside its borders. Um, and again, that's very consistent. So talk a little bit about the hatred he had for William Crawford. Yes. So mm -hmm. Crawford is, as you point out, he's a prominent American yes. at this point. Maybe knowing a little more about him will help and, and then also allow us to understand better what, what Jackson's beef was with him. Yeah, so William Crawford is a kind of Republican, this Jeffersonian stalwart. He's, in, he's both Secretary of uh, Treasury and Secretary of War. Um, he's also a representative in France uh, during the War of 1812. And he repeatedly, right after the War of 1812, tells Jackson in a pretty condescending way, um, you know, you can't. Uh, just make treaties with the, these conquest treaties with the Creeks. Only the national government can do that. You can't uh, overstep the bounds, even though you're now a major general in the United States Army. Um, you know, essentially, we're in charge. And there's several lines where he says, he lectures Jackson and says, you know, okay, listen, little boy. Um, I mean, it's almost that tone. 
in a civilized society like we have, <laughs> the law means you have to obey the law. You understand? <laughs> and you know, Jack, you I give this some... lecture at law school all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and Jackson just, you know, I, he's, he thinks again that the federal government is protecting natives. He thinks again that the federal government is, that someone in the federal government is not being grateful for the services that he's just rendered, which he certainly did. Um, so, I mean, he, he despises him. He calls him the whore of Babylon. Um, he repeatedly says in letters, you know, if Crawford is, Crawford is the most dangerous person for the republic, if he becomes president, all is lost. And it looked like Crawford would become president well, after Monroe. He's, and Crawford, I think, was also a party to sort of the release of some damaging information about... He, Yes, yes, he was. So yeah. Crawford also is one of the important people to really criticize constitu yeah, constitutionally uh, the um, uh, Treaty of Fort Jackson, which Jackson forces upon the entire Creek Nation, not just those that had been fighting and attacking white households. Uh, that's, I think, for Jackson the most, you know, the most damning thing. Um, but in addition, it really is, he's, Crawford seems to be standing in the way of what Jackson's vision is, as is War of 1812, which is an entire southern uh, uh, land, totally, in his words, uh, free of Indians. That is to say, undivided uh, sovereignty for white uh, planters uh, to take their crops to market. Um, Crawford seems to be standing in the way of that. It's a mystery as to why Crawford did so. Many of his papers burned. Some of them are in Duke, but you know, very hard to trace. I think that Crawford was really just kind of, I think, frankly, he was a, a career politician and a very good one who just saw no particular value in picking a fight with the Chickasaws or Choctaws at that moment. And Jackson characteristically takes that as a personal insult. And it's an important part of the story because you know, now we think of most historians writing about Jackson, stress how much he hated Henry Clay, uh, stress how much he came to despise John Quincy Adams. But the earlier thing is all about Crawford. And Crawford is. I think the heir apparent, really, to Monroe, the caucus guy um, in 1816, even, and 20, and he seems to be in line. Um, and Crawford also knows this and you know, despises Jackson. Uh, there's, a, there's reciprocity in that hatred. So, so, so as you mentioned, um, and as we know, uh, Jackson's going to end up emerging on the national scene and become a candidate for the presidency. How, how does that come about? So in 1822, what we know is there's kind of a spontaneous uh, movement for Jackson as president in Pennsylvania, which is the key to his coalition, uh, and Tennessee. In Tennessee, it's much more um, a plan between Jackson and his friends. I think a lot of it has to do with the relief efforts, uh, pro-debtor stuff that he was very offended by. But in any case, he decides by early 22 to re-enter politics. On July 4th, 1822, he gives what I take to be his first sort of like campaign speech. Um, which is really interesting. And he says, he talks all about the bleeding nation that we have avenged, uh, the long threat to the Republic by the British and Indians. Um, so he re-enters politics that way. There's a group of Tennessee Nashville uh, notables who kind of coordinate his campaign. Um, one finds this also in R Richmond and other places, but they coordinate the campaign quite well. They use his authorized biography and a re uh, new edition of it to make certain claims about Jackson. Um, and it takes off uh, both because it's a coordinated campaign in Nashville and because there's such, uh, there's no other word, grassroots uh, love for Jackson, certainly in all the slave states, definitely in Pennsylvania, and in most of the West, too. He's much more controversial elsewhere, but that's more than enough to win the presidency. So with Jack, and of course, um, at the same time that Jackson is emerging on the scene nationally as a possible candidate, the other candidates are going to be jockeying for position yes. as well. They're all quite notable. Yes. There's, so we need to set the scene for one of the most dramatic presidential yeah. elections in history. William Crawford's there, although by this time he's really incapacitated. Yeah, he's a stroke, yeah. He's had a stroke, which seems to be kept largely as a secret. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. All, and people end up voting for him That's right. in spite of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and who are the other people that are on this scene? So we have John Quincy Adams, who had just really defended Jackson... Uh, for Jackson's actions in Florida. So he's also campaigning as a nationalist. You have Henry Clay, who says, you know, if you want to be a nationalist, then you need to vote for tariffs and a system of the economy. Uh, so you have Clay, you have John Quincy Adams, you have Crawford, uh, Calhoun, 
Um, very interesting case in his own way. At this time, still a nationalist, so he's a Secretary of War. He really wanted to improve the United States military. Only later does it become a Southern you know, extremist. Um, you have all these people jockeying for position, and um, there's really a way where it's quite remarkable how quickly Jackson's campaign organizes. They have you know, powerful uh, support in all the Southern states, although so does John Quincy Adams, and so does Crawford, and so does Calhoun, and so does Clay. Um, but Jackson comes off with the most electoral votes and probably the most, the most popular votes as well. Um, there is a new research uh, which indicates that because the state of New York at this time did not popularly elect the electors, if the state of New York had done so and all the votes were counted, probably John Quincy Adams, not Andrew Jackson, would have had the most popular vote, which is a remarkable, it's quite convincing, I think. Um, and it shows John Quincy Adams is no sort of unpopular, curmudgeonly New Englander. He had national support. He had votes everywhere. He had well-run campaign. And he was running, you know, campaigning as a nationalist. Um, but as it turns out, the course election has to go to the House. Um, and John Quincy Adams then appoints Henry Clay as Secretary of State, which is thought to be sort of the next step towards the presidency. All of Jackson's supporters call it, uh, they, they, they quickly come to the phrase, corrupt bargain. Um, I think it's notable, though, that Jackson, until this period, he, when he attacks people, he often says they're demagogues, not tyrants. Um, those terms shift later, but you know, it, it perfectly um, captures a sense of grievance. right? So not only is it now Jackson's grievances, it's the people's grievances because the government has ignored their love for Andrew Jackson. And it's, you know, it's the ideal kind of campaign gift in some, some ways that he lost in 1824. Because it comes back in 28, consolidates the Southern vote, um, and says, you know, let's avenge the people again. Let's vote your, the people's favorite. So as, uh, Jackson's, as you point out, um, somebody who's pretty popular. Um, and he, there's a claim, of course, he's got that he should have won the, the, the presidency the first time he runs. Um, I want to go back to whatever platform he had. What, what's he running on? We, you mentioned what some of the other folks are running on. What, what's he offering uh, as, the, as the presidential candidate at this, at this point? So his, his supporters, I mean, to my mind, really, especially in 1828, once there's no more so other Southern rivals. So he really has the Southern vote consolidated. Mm -hmm. And it energized, too, because John Quincy Adams had deeply offended, um, especially Georgia. And even Crawford says, you got to vote for Jackson. <laughs> and they, they all, the South is entirely with Jackson. Um, his supporters in Pennsylvania, which to me is the most important state because of the electoral votes and because it's not clear he's going to win there, they stress he did vote for the 1824 tariffs. Um, oh, that's a really an important point. They say that they mention that he is, um, stands against the caucus, the Congressional Caucus, which has already uh, been challenged at the state level. Those two things you could say are relatively clear campaign promises. The rest is, this, the argument is the man. You, you vote, you're voting for Andrew Jackson because Andrew Jackson is pure and uncorruptible. He's uncorruptible and he's proven that through heroic violence. Um, He's above the scheming and corruption in Washington, D.C. And if you want to reclaim Washington, D.C. in that way, you need to vote for Jackson. I, you know, none of those things are, are necessarily in dispute. But it is important to note that they don't talk about specific things about the economy. They don't, except for the tariff, they don't talk about the new effort to make a more coordinated economy uh, in light of the Panic of 1819, which I think is really important. Um, they go with the man, not the, not the measures. And it does seem that it's a closer run thing than perhaps we thought. John Quincy Adams should have gone to Pennsylvania and spoken in German to all those German-speaking voters. Uh, I mean, he actually was, could speak German. If so I was his campaign director, <laughs> I would have been really upset to have the, the, what they ran. Um, but uh, the, the well-managed the well, um, well legend of Jackson is, proves to be unbeatable. Um, I'll just mention one other thing. In, in Pennsylvania, the big campaign uh, pamphlets that were read about Jackson uh, were called Letters of Wyoming. And it's like, what was Wyoming? What is that about? That, that's a direct reference to the Wyoming massacre uh, in Pennsylvania in 1778, in which uh, loyalist and native peoples killed lots of white families, uh, patriots, in Pennsylvania. No one knows what Wyoming is outside of Pennsylvania, but it's a perfect way to appeal to say, again, you know, avenge the people, remember what has happened, remember the blood we have shed, and vote for Andrew Jackson. 
In fact, it was written by John Eden um, in Tennessee, but you know, it's a really powerful piece. It does mention the caucus. It does mention, very briefly, uh, the tariff. But it's mostly about the letters of Wyoming, remember the blood that has been shed, and, and redeem Andrew Jackson. So now that he's president of the United States, what are his priorities? Indian removal. I mean, I, to, to my mind, what well, you can really tell, to my mind, you can tell what a president's priorities are. Number one, who do they appoint? And number two, what are they willing to spend political capital on? So he arranges very carefully with um, the Attorney General and the Secretary of War uh, and people in Georgia to begin the process of native removal, which is enormously complicated. Um, I differ here with a number of historians that are more esteemed than me, so you can read other things. I don't think that Indian removal was such a kind of inevitable, predictable process. Because for most Americans living outside of those areas, relations with the Cherokee and Creek were improving and stabilizing, not degenerating. And, but Indian removal is a very well-run process uh, between the White House and the state-level uh, politicians in Georgia especially, also Mississippi and Alabama, to extend state laws over Native peoples, um, and then to either buy them out or to make particular deals with some of their leaders for removal. And I think that it's his biggest priority. He seems to be the most willing to sacrifice political capital for this. Uh, removal is not popular in Pennsylvania, so he definitely makes a hit in this keystone state. But he's, that's fine. He's going to do it. Um, he's willing to overcome Supreme Court decisions that seem to cast doubt on his ability to do this. He's willing to overcome any uh, any opposition. And I think it's really important for us to consider, I would think that except for the war of 1812, Indian removal, which involves forcibly removing 70,000 people, uh, that's counting to the 1840s, uh, from thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, acres across thousands of miles to uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas is perhaps the most massive federal undertaking in early American history, besides the wars themselves. And yet somehow, it's sort of not seen as a kind of governmental form of activism. Yes, it is. I mean, they, they, this is, involves in a tremendous amount of resources over a decade. And so what is the rule of law, if any, that he's vindicating in all of this? I think he's saying that the rule of law presumes um, the sovereignty, that's a crucial thing for him, of white Americans. And you have to make the racial distinction of white Americans to go wherever they want to take their, go wherever their business takes them, secure in the right, secure in the knowledge that their property is secure uh, and will be protected by the courts. This means that native populations in their way, literally on the way, in their way to market, in the way for people to have farms or plantations is, is a insult. So the rule of law begins where white sovereignty is established. That can't happen if there's these large nations in the southeastern United States. And of course, he's got a lot of different kinds of battles he's going to wage as president of the United States. Yes. You, you mentioned one of the more notorious, and the other, of course, involves something not too far from here, and that's the National Bank. Yes. So what happens with the National Bank? I see the National Bank as being, um, it's not his main priority. I wouldn't even say it's a second priority. He wants to get rid of a lot of appointees. But, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how did it become a priority? Had to become a priority because I, the, the president uh, of the Second Bank of the United States, Biddle, um, really is, he voted for Jackson in 28, which is an important thing because he didn't think there was going to be a problem. He really is angling for a larger place for the National Bank, for the Bank of the United States. He wants to work with Jackson to retire the debt earlier by using the bank. He's pressing Jackson and he's using, he's emerging as a separate power source. He's also colluding with Henry Clay, and who Jackson increasingly despises. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new threat. I do think it's a, I think it's a lot of it is that. I think a lot of it is it's the threat of another uh, power source, uh, the threat of a powerful institution. Um, he also had heard, as it turns out, at first incorrectly and later correctly, that the Second Bank of the United States was basically bribing people to vote uh, for Adams and later to pay newspaper editors, which, which does happen. So he's not wrong in seeing it as corrupting. Um, but as of January 1832, I don't think he had any, made any decision. Maybe we recharter it. Maybe we change the charter. Maybe we do any number of things. Then Biddle presses again for a new charter early, four years early. And Jackson takes this as a kind of declaration of war. And from that time on, the Second Bank of the United States becomes this huge battle. Um, and again, he's willing to bear any price. I mean, you know, it's not 
I, I think it's, again, really a misreading to say that the Second Bank of the United States was opposed by all the people. No, it wasn't. In, in Pennsylvania, people wanted, uh, you know, it was popular in, all of, in most of Pennsylvania. Many people in the western states and eastern states wanted a relatively sound currency that didn't lose value across state lines, which the bank bills did. So, you know, he turns it into the enemy um, just as much as it already was the enemy. And the veto in July 1832 is you know, hugely important. Um, I think read carefully, you know, it doesn't say, um, it says essentially the rule of law and formal equality has or should be already in existence. Therefore, further kinds of governmental interference is corruption waiting to happen, uh, and this bank is, is, is a direct threat to us. Um, the economic effects are very hard to suss out. Um, they definitely intertwine with Indian removal because there's so much land now available that there's so much demand for more money and there's no monetary clearinghouse anymore. The inflationary spiral is pretty dramatic. Um, but he makes the bank his enemy. He, like always, he personalizes his enemies. Uh, I will kill the bank, he says. You know, I, it's like something that will <laughs> kill you. Um, but I don't think it was the plan. I, I really I think it's Indian removal is the you know, first term, and, and uh, the war with the bank is a dominant thing in the second term. And we've, you've talked about Jackson's organization as he ran for the presidency. Um, what we, we didn't mention was the founding of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's something else that becomes associated with, with uh, Andrew Jackson and his rise to power. Yeah. So how, what's Jackson's uh, involvement with that? And, and, and I guess ultimately, how does the Democratic Party as a party um, somehow reconcile itself with Jackson's volatile personality? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I would say that the, you know, the organizational roots are 18, early 1820s. And again, it's sort of Pennsylvania and then and all the South. Uh, New Hampshire also is in this. And it's, at first, I would say it's strung together by very powerful newspaper editors who you know, they, they will take things from the Nashville Junto, from the committee itself, and reprint them. They'll take letters at Jackson himself. He's very personally involved in this. will write, and then they'll reprint them. And then that goes from this to new conventions at the state level, which replace caucuses. Um, so there's a, there's a genuine sense that there's both a kind of top-down organization and a bottom-up enthusiasm, again, for the man, for Jackson. And by 1828, it's quite powerful. By 1832, it's institutionalized in the sense that it's internally disciplined. Um, and this is the origin of the term Jacksonian democracy. He just calls it the democracy refers to the Democratic Party, not you know, democracy as all of democracy. And um, you know Clay and the Whigs who are developing in the early 1830s find out and the, the, the Democrats are extraordinarily well organized. And for at least, I would say, a decade, they have the jump on the, on the Whigs in terms of how you organize state, state, county, county, how you discipline a message, how you get candidates together in, a, in an organized fashion, and how you get a set of symbols and rituals uh, to get people out to vote. Um, songs, Jacksonians sing songs when they go to vote. They go in groups to vote. Um, you know, there's no accurate polling, so you have to kind of go by the momentum you can manifest. And the Democrats are much better at it because they have the man that stirs the most passions. So I want to zero in on a couple other things that happened while Jackson's president before I come back to a, a bigger view on Jackson. Um, he's picking fights one or another all throughout his presidency. Uh, one of the more notorious is one that doesn't sometimes get written a lot about, but it is with this old friend Easton, mm. um, and particularly with regard to trying hey. to protect the honor of Easton's sure. wife. Yep. So what's, what is that furor, uh, and what is, what's the result of it? Yeah, so John Eaton, who's one of his major military subordinates, back to the War of 1812, he trusts you know, Tim completely. Eaton and Coffey, as these two guys, are his two major sort of lieutenants. Uh, he's very powerful as the Secretary of War. He's in, in charge of Indian removal. That's like his job. Um, and his wife, uh, Peggy, was controversial because her previous husband uh, had uh, been at sea. There was widely spread whispers that she was not faithful to him, and he killed himself. Uh, the idea being the rumor was that he'd done so because she was unfaithful. John Eden marries her, and many of the women in these inner circles in, in Washington, D.C., uh, shun Peggy Eden as a, as a display. We're not going to accept this woman at our table. Literally, like, 
accept her to invitations to events, which are not just social events, they're political events. And Jackson takes this as a personal insult because Eaton is one of his guys. Um, and there's really good evidence that he really reorganizes his cabinet uh, because of this. Uh, the big winner here is Martin Van Buren, who otherwise is not in the inner circle of Jacksonians. He's from New York, and um, you know it's not just. Um, uh, it, it, so it's an example. It's, we should never underestimate that Jackson's the force of his personality. It's not just that he's reflecting certain things. He's making things happen because someone has made him angry. Um, that's usually his motivating uh, emotion is fury, anger. And he was furious at both the wives and the, their husbands who would not take Peggy Eden as an equal. Probably sort of a paging Dr. Freud moment here. This is something to do with his own situation, with his own wife back in the 1790s. Um, I think it's more, no, this is my guy. Eaton is my man. He can marry who he wants. Any way in, into that is an insult to me, uh, to my sort of uh, household. And of course, that, as you point out, like, um, one, of the, um, one of the beneficiaries of, of that, of his essentially dismissing his cabinet, um, or reorganizing it, uh, dismissing it and then reorganizing That's right, it, yeah, yeah. Um, is Martin Van Buren. But that, that puts uh, Jackson in conflict with his vice president. That's right. And so that's a whole other, um, I don't know whether you, how would we describe that, a battle of honor? But there's a stare down to yeah, some yeah. extent between Jackson and John Calhoun, his vice president. Yes. Uh, so Calhoun is really fascinating. In it's during ja uh, John Quincy Adams' term, you know, sort of shifts and really goes towards Jackson um, as the guy who we can trust against John Quincy Adams. So he's a Jacksonian for five years, um, but he increasingly has this distrust about about Jackson um, as someone that you can't depend on because. He is too passionate. He's getting. He's letting his personal uh, rage get in the way of policy. Um, and then, of course, there's the extremism in South Carolina with regard to the tariff. To my mind, Jackson really, in his hard part, is much more of a free trader, uh, free trade for tyrannical households. Important to say, free trade for enslaved households, uh, than protectionist. But he's, you know, he's moderate, and he's a, he's a very practical unionist. He wants to make sure the union stays together. And South Carolina's increasingly militant stance on the tariff personally offends him. Um, he describes it as a replevin law, which is like his earlier lawyer coming out on him. Um, and here now you have Calhoun uh, taking on the kind of honor of South Carolina versus the Jacksonian nation uh, with tremendous consequences for the Democrats. Yes, and so. Uh, um, the, the, the interpersonal conflicts are extraordinary, yes. especially because the, they have immense ramifications for policy, the Constitution, yes. and, of course, the country. Um, in all of this, I'm wondering, where does Thomas Jefferson fit in? Jackson, to some extent, I, th I think, uh, tries to sort of see himself as the heir, uh, at least um, uh, in, either intellectually or politically, uh, as the heir to, to Jefferson. So how does Jefferson figure into this? I'm really glad you asked that. Um, here again, the, the Jackson legend is, you know, conceals a lot. There's this thing, this statement, this idea that Jefferson saw Jackson early in his first term in Congress and said, you know, this man's dangerous. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, they write plenty of letters, though, during the 1800s where Jefferson says, you know, you stay in line. You know, you're, and he clearly doesn't distrust him in that way. Um, yes, there is the idea that the Democratic Party until quite recently, set, maybe they still do in some states, set, celebrated the Jefferson-Jackson dinner. Um, I, I, I think this is, um, there are surface similarities. I think it's incorrect. To my mind, Jefferson's idea of natural rights is entirely different than Jackson's. Um, Jefferson, to my mind, his idea of natural rights, which is the basis of much of his politics, his political philosophy at least, has to do with the lost freedoms of nature, which society should sort of try to restore in some ways. That's just not all what Jackson thinks of as nature. For, for, for Jackson, nature is people killing you, or you trying to kill them. And that's a very different orientation of politics. Uh, it, 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 it manifests in all kinds of ways. But I see them as very, very different men, uh, very different political thinkers. and. Um, I mean, I'll be very honest, I, I, I mentioned earlier, I did not start writing this book 10 years ago 
to go off on or to smirch Andrew Jackson. I really did not. I really wanted to know why he was so mad and why people, why that resonated. Um, that's all being said, and I tried to be as fair as I could and to use the footnotes accordingly. But I will say, in the final analysis, I think that Jeffersonian ideas are much more useful for a healthy democracy for us. I think even that Federalist ideas in, in various ways about civil order are much more useful to us than Jackson, Jackson idea, Jacksonian ideas. And that's not because I think Jackson was a liar or whatever else, he, he was not. I am just saying that I think the, 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 what we get out of Jacksonian ideas, frankly, don't, don't help us much um, in the 21st century. Well, that may or may not lead to the last question, um, which also touches on not just the question from the audience, but something you and I were talking about before we came out. Um, obviously, one of the things that is um, uh, controversial and has pr provoked some conflict in different parts of the country, particularly the part of the country I'm from, um, North Carolina, has to do with monuments. Um, and we began by noting that there's a giant monument of Andrew Jackson uh, in Raleigh. Um, and so as we gain more knowledge about some of the people for whom there are monuments, what what are what are the ramifications for the monuments? Yeah, I think I was saying earlier. I mean, my general sort of impulse as a history teacher is to have more monuments, not fewer. Um, I like I like having more. I Maybe even like a adding, museum. Let's. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying. I there's something discomfort. I, I I'm not sort of necessarily understanding, or um, I'm not, I understand. I'm not necessarily on board with. The idea of, of you know removing um, uh, you know most monuments. Um, I see distinct a, a big distinction between Confederate monuments and monuments to Jefferson or Washington. Um, but the stakes are, to my mind, is this: if you raise someone up literally on a pedestal, um, it does speak volumes about wh who you think represents the United States, what you think the American people, who exactly the American people are. Uh, and what they can do. And so we should just be mindful that monuments matter. I mean, we were saying earlier, there are times where monuments sort of are just sort of rest dormant, and they're kind of just these sort of background relics. Then uh, other times they become touchstones of political and cultural uh, and moral conflict. Um, but they always will do that, because they're, they're lifting someone up and saying, you should emulate this person, or you should admire this person. And I just think we should be mindful that we're doing so. Um, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and and um, the question we can talk about afterwards is, who's there to avenge Jackson's legacy, uh, a, a legacy that itself involves so much revenge? Yes. Um, I, uh, it's always a tremendous pleasure and privilege to be part of any conversation here. I want to thank Jason Opal for sharing his wisdom and his insights into Jackson. He'll be here to sign copies of his book afterwards. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.